Hi everyone, welcome to the setup of the exhibition. Um, I just wanted to show you the process of making the work because a lot of the work comes in comes into the gallery in small boxes and then the work expands. So um, we're in the process of making the work expand to take up more space. Um, so the first piece I'll show you is this ice crystal piece. There's only a few crystals up, um, but you can see they're kind of sculptural embroidered works. So I'm going to take these and pin them onto the wall. And you can see there's this, uh, some of them on the ground here. So we're just taking from this pile and then installing on the wall there. So this work is based around uh, frost patterns and ice crystals. So in this show I'm thinking a lot about natural phenomena. So the next piece, speaking of natural phenomena, the next piece is this garden, which we're slowly building. Um, and we're taking pieces of wire and then attaching each single bloom to the piece of wire. Um, and eventually this will kind of fill this middle part of the gallery. And right here we'll have a pathway. So this is in the process of coming together. We've got lots of people helping with this process because it takes a long time <laughs> to put these things together. Um, and then the third piece I want to show you just in progress is, are these neon clouds, which is what the show is called. Um, so we're just putting together these um, suspended hanging pieces. Um, and what I did is I came to the gallery with threads on the piece, so we're attaching them to the ceiling. Each one has an individual thread, so when people are in the gallery, they will kind of pivot and move, um, and you'll be able to walk in and around them. So it'll be this kind of experience, this kind of cinematic experience, so you'll be able to kind of come in and walk around these large um, clouds and kind of be enveloped in the pattern. The show will be up until November 22nd. Um, so welcome everybody to Neon Clouds. Um, I'm very excited about this exhibition. Um, the space here has been really um, wonderful to work in. It feels like there's room to kind of create and move. So um, I wanted to start um, the artist talk within the clouds because this is really the starting point in my mind for the exhibition. Um, I would like to thank a few people before I start. Um, first, Nadine for helping so much with the exhibition. Um, she really has an eye for detail and she's got these problem solving skills that really help make the exhibition happen. Um, and I, I do have to talk about the way that this work is installed. It's really labor intensive, so um, there were volunteers helping this week. And is Laura Ann still here? Laura Ann helped um, a lot and we had about four or five other volunteers so without other people's help a show like this can't come together so um, I consider both Nadine and Laura Ann to be like a big part of this exhibition so thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank the Ontario Arts Council for helping to support some of the um, process of making these pieces. Um, it really does take some outside help for me to be able to execute large works like this. Um, and then I want to thank the uh, selection committee for inviting me to uh, create within this space. Um, so yeah, lots of thank yous, but on to the work. So what I'd like to do is kind of start back here and move out. So we're going to do just a little walkthrough. It's really casual. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. If I'm not talking loud enough, let me know. Um, but uh, all of this work started with uh, an interest in line. So I'm really interested in drawn line and drawing. So these pieces are really conceptualized as drawings um, first and then as sculptures and installations. So I started the process of working with thread and embroidery um, in my undergraduate career, so around 2007. 
I was looking at um, line, and I thought that threaded line was really interesting because uh, it's, um, it appears to be kind of flat. Um, it's very slight, and you can hardly see one piece. But when it's uh, accumulated, you can start to feel a real presence. And um, I was also interested in how it's not just flat, it's sculptural, but the sculptural line is quite slight. So um, within these pieces, although they're flat, they also do have a sculptural element to them when they're flipped and when they start to turn in space. Um, so as a drawer, I was interested in line, and I kind of created this art problem for myself. I thought that it'd be really interesting to have a piece that existed only out of line and only out of stitching. So I went on to kind of problem solve. I was sewing into um, wax paper, regular paper. Um, I was sewing into sheets of wax that I made for myself, but really trying to find a surface to stitch into um, so that I could create this idea that I had in my head. Um, and then after a little bit of research, I found this product that was a mystery to me, but any sewer or fiber art person will be like, oh yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the material you needed. But coming from a, a fine arts background, I really didn't have that to, those tools, to kind of, that knowledge to kind of pick from. So um, the material that I used to create all of the works in this exhibition is called Solvi, and it's a water-soluble stabilizer. And I'll show you some pieces of Solvi when we get outside. Um, but what it allows is for me to have this surface to stitch into, um, and then once the lines are built up and there's a network, I can then dissolve the base. So art problem solved. Um, when I first started working with the material, I was doing a lot of representational work. Um, I was creating pictures of my hands, these kind of self-portraits. And I do have a body of work that's more representational. Um, but this body of work is more reflective of some formal interests I have. So I'm really interested in line and color. And so I've been kind of concentrating on those those two elements in these cloud works. So um, the idea of saturated line, I'm really interested in these neon colors because um, you can hardly see the thread when you kind of hold it up, but as it uh, becomes more and more accumulated, you begin to see this kind of saturated color. So that kind of accumulation is present within the stitching of each of these pieces. And it's also present within my process, so I'm replicating and accumulating that line. And so this accumulated color then starts to saturate the space. Um, so I'm interested in these neon colors. They're kind of like warning colors, um, so like hazard signs. Um, but I'm also interested in how they can feel kind of toxic or unnatural. And I'm interested in creating natural phenomena um, out of these kind of saturated toxic colors. Um, and uh, so these are abstracted shapes kind of based on spirographs. Um, I'm interested in line. Um, but that kind of abstraction is present within all the works in the space. So these are abstracted clouds kind of floating um, in the gallery. But the flowers are also abstracted. So I'm interested in kind of taking forms and working through them, kind of not making something that's only like from a drawing, but kind of creating like symbols or more abstracted shapes. Um, okay, I'm gonna just. Yeah. So um, let's move to the uh, flowers, if we could, and I'll just kind of stand in this corner here. So um, kind of a note about timing and how these pieces came to be. Um, the cloud started with the orange, I did the orange cloud first, and I had uh, thought of that piece as kind of hovering like a, a smog or cloud above the viewer, so I installed it in the hallway when it was first made. Um, and then I decided like for this show that it would be interesting to feel more in the cloud, um, so to not look up, but to look through. And uh, a lot of these pieces in the space 
are all are uh, modular, so there's options for installing. So every time I install the work, it's a completely different um, process, and I try to change the pieces because they do have this flexibility. So the first couple times that these pieces were installed, they were like a, a cloud over top, and this time I really wanted to make them these dense areas of saturated color. So, um, so this is uh, the first time they're displayed this way, um, and that goes for these flowers as well. So these flowers are installed on uh, wires coming out from the ground. And uh, the last time I installed this work, they were hanging from um, threads from the ceiling, much like this piece here. But what happened when they were hung by threads is they kind of started to look more like jellyfish than flowers. So, you know, as you go through the process of making, I'm sure, other artists in the room, you know, your projects change and there's a little bit of shifting that happens. And I think just paying attention to those shifts is really important. So, it was interesting that the work was, gel like, was referencing jellyfish, but I was interested in um, installing the work in the space this time so that it really referenced flowers in a, a field or a garden. So um, this time they're installed from pins coming up from the floor. So um, there's this dynamic between the two pieces where there's lines coming down with the clouds and then lines emerging up from the ground with the flowers. And I find the tension between those two things to be really interesting in the space. Um, when we were conceptualizing about the show, I was really interested in creating a kind of um, faux landscape. Um, so I was thinking about landscape paintings and uh, the way we often see landscape, like these kind of vistas. So I thought that the point at the door would be like a painting. So this kind of sight line where you're looking, there's flowers and clouds. Um, so that it would function kind of like a picture. Um, but then I really wanted it to feel like a picture you could walk into. So the second experience is more about the working sculpture and um, being in space. So those kind of two, two things which reference my interest in both drawing and sculpture. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? Um, another thing I wanted to talk about with the exhibition is the, the role of color in the space. So I was thinking about um, the ice crystals on the far wall there being a kind of entrance piece. Um, they've got uh, light colors, there's this hint of like an icy blue. And so I was interested in the, in the work moving from kind of subtle color to medium saturation to full saturation at the back here. So this kind of transition of color through the space. Um, and that kind of had to do with just the, the way that people would experience um, coming through. Um, and then the last piece in the show that I'd like to just touch on are these ice crystals. Um, and with the work here, like the garden piece, I was really interested in taking the, the flat drawn embroidered pieces and trying to embrace a more sculptural approach. And the ice crystals are another iteration of that move towards sculpture. Um, they're made out of flat embroideries that are then kind of pieced together so that they have dimension to it and working with planes um, and creating um, small scale sculptures that also function as drawings. So you see the shadows on the walls and I'm interested in like the sculpture next to what looks like a drawing. Um, that piece was made for a gallery in Toronto. They, it's a design store called Made, and um, they had a gallery space in the back of their uh, store that used to be a cooler, um, so that it was a restaurant and that's where they would put all the cold storage. So I was interested in that previous life of this space, um, and I thought that I'd kind of do a tribute to the space's previous function. So the first installation of this work was um, along the walls of this previous cooler space, um, kind of referencing freezer frost and ice crystals, and again creating a kind of abstracted language 
Um, with all of the work in the show, I'm looking at source material, and I brought some of my source material for you guys to see, just to get an idea of the way that I move through um, making my images. There's a lot of testing that I do, a lot of sketching. Um, so I was looking at uh, my microscope images of frost crystals for that piece on one wall. Um, and then with these works, spirographs, um, poppies, tulips. Um, and I was asked earlier if this was supposed to reference poppies, and the answer is yes, but it's also meant to reference other sorts of flowers, so tulips and daffodils. I wanted to find a form that would kind of be suggestive of all sorts of flowers, not just one. But um, with any installation, there's there's timing, right? So the next day is coming up, so I could see why the poppy reference would kind of be in the forefront of people's minds. Um, so yeah, does anyone no questions? If there's no questions, we'll just move to um, the tables just outside of the gallery, and I'll just move through the process of, of making. So when Nadine and I were talking about the show and, and where the show is and who supports the show, we were thinking about like the relationship of the gallery to the Ottawa School of Art. So um, I'm really interested in education and. I just graduated from my master's. I was studying in Philadelphia at Tyler School of Art. Um, and I am interested in process. Um, so while I was at school, I was thinking a lot about the making process and the kind of mistakes or accidents and testing that happens within the making process. Because it was those sort of moments and, and that kind of like in-progress stuff that felt really interesting and important. Um, and I started to become really interested in the idea of things being unfinished and how that contains some sort of potential for the work to exist in many ways. And I think that that, um, that interest is present within uh, the way that these works are installed, the way I formulate them, because they can exist as many different things. So. Um, these work, works will have future lives as different um, installations. And I think that really relates to the process of making work and kind of moving through different iterations of maybe the same thing. Um, so I wanted to show everyone that's here today these kind of drawings and samples. And you're welcome to touch any of this. Um, that I was looking at when I was thinking about the work for the show. Um, a lot of things relating to botanicals um, and sort of different material tests. Um, and so, so you'll see here, these works didn't really make it beyond the testing stage, but I've got the um, image of a flower, um, this kind of outline that I started to work with, just abstracting the shape a little bit. Um, and then I moved to sewing that shape and then dissolving it so there's spaces within the work. Um, and then I moved to kind of assembling the work in a different way, so finding these different iterations and different um, stages within the work to be interested in. And I've, I've started to um, sort of take my process and try to archive it a little bit. Um, I think sometimes those moments get lost, and, and this stuff seems really exciting and relevant afterwards. Um, so that's just one example of the way I was moving through things. Oh, and because you guys are here, I'm going to pass things around so you can touch the work. Um, and I'll start this one over here. So, um, so you'll see those ones are dissolved, and then I've got some other pieces that have not have already been dissolved as well. I'll pass those around. And maybe this too. Um, so I'm going to show you. This is the fabric I used to make all of the work in the installations. It kind of looks like interfacing or a dryer sheet. Um, but this is the solvy. So this material dissolves in water. So if you um, sneeze on it, it will dissolve. If your hands are a little sweaty, it will dissolve. 
um, and it's quite sensitive to moisture, so in the winter time it gets a little bit brittle, in the summertime it's really great to work with. Um, but this material is used extensively in embroidery, so any embroiderer is going to know exactly what this is. To me, this material still seems really magical. Um, but it also has other applications. It's used in hospitals um, to uh, you put soiled uh, clothing in it, and then you can wash the bag that's made out of this material. Um, and that dissolves at a higher temperature, but it's essentially the same technology. So lots of different applications. What, I know you gave the name before, but what's it called? Uh, the brand name is called Saldi. And so this is one particular kind. This is called Saldi. I order it on, online from a website, but you can get it at Fabricland. Um, if you go to the States, Joann's has all sorts of types of the fabric, so a little bit more selection in the States. And what is that one called? It's called Fabri Solvi. Okay. So that one has a little bit more give than this one. This one is uh, just the regular material, and this looks more like saran wrap. Um, but it really gives you a nice surface to sew into. Um, and this material will bond to itself with heat. So you can sandwich different fibers inside, fuse it with heat, and then stitch into it. So there's lots of options for this. So I'll pass that around to you. Um, so you guys can just get a sense of the feel of things. So that's my first material I work with. The second material is this polyester thread. I really like the colors I can get in polyester. And polyester tends to hold its shape a little bit better than cotton, I find. So you can see how slight that line is, the thread. Um, and I'm really interested in how you can hardly see that. So this is just regular serger thread. It's not anything high tech, but I'll pass that around too so you guys can just get a sense of the feel of like one, one line of it. So thread, salvi, embroidery hoop. Um, and scissors, and then I have just a really basic sewing machine here. My um, sewing machine broke before I came to the exhibition. That always seems to happen before a show. So this is a friend of mine's machine, um, and I put the embroidery hoop in the machine. I use the foot, um, and I just sew straight lines. So I'm going to just do this for a minute, um, and people are welcome to try afterwards. Um, or the flowers, I generally don't draw on the fabric. I kind of just spin, spin the piece. And it took a little bit of practice, but I am um, not able to do it with my eyes closed, but I can do it pretty fast. So you see how I'm just kind of spinning that using the hoop as my edge so that my my foot kind of hits it and I know that I'm going to turn the piece around so after I'm done the demo people are welcome to try any of these steps um, and I encourage you to to if you're interested in sewing there's lots of potential for this material I did for the demo is I have a bright color on the top thread and a black on the bottom so you can see the way the thread kind of gets marbled. Um, it, uh, it creates a different effect when sorry, I just want this to heat up. It creates a different effect when there's a marbling or when there's a different bobbin thread versus top thread. So in this piece you'll see there's a, a little bit of a shimmer to the work because the bobbin is different from the top. So after I'm done with the sewing, um, I end up with these kind of disc pieces. Um, and I have them generally in, in similar sizes, so I cut them out. I save all of the salvi. It's quite expensive to work with, so save every little piece, and then you can dissolve it and create starch um, to stiffen the work. So nothing, none of that salvi is wasted out of bags and bags of it. 
So after I'm done the sewing, I take these and I generally stack them together just to keep them a little bit more stable. I thought of this kind of like a cooking show. So I'm kind of trying to have everything prepared um, in advance so we can just move through the steps. So the next step is dissolving with water. It can be any temperature. This is just lukewarm. Then I place it in a bin of water. And uh, I'm do that and then pour more on top. And you'll see that the fabric just dissolves very easily. And so I'll tap this a little bit. Um, it doesn't take long. And then tap it. And then this might need a little bit more time, but you can already see that it's, it's uh, creating those spaces within the work. And then, oh, my cooking show thing. I didn't have a, I don't have a towel. Uh, but you put that on a towel and just let it dry. So that's the one, two, third step. And then the fourth step, I did want to share the, um, the flowers with you um, because that kind of happened from a mistake. So paying attention to process and what materials can do, something that um, I think about a lot when I'm in the studio. So I was creating the, the green cloud and I had this piece that looked like this. And I really like when the work is just so flat. So I iron every single piece. Um, and when I was ironing one of these scribble pieces, the starch on the, on the piece caught and it pulled, it pulled the, the embroidery. And in my mind at the time, I said like, oh, it's destroyed. Like, great. Um, but when I thought about it a little bit more, I thought, well, if I replicate that mistake, it will pull all of the edges up and can create a form. So, that's where this whole large installation came from, is kind of a mistake. Um, and just thinking about things, maybe not as mistakes, but as potential. So I'm going to pass around these little bloom forms and um, want them to just play around with them. They're really durable, so you can move them and move them around. And those ones are quite starch, so they have a bit of bounce to them. So does the starch come out of the thing that you've dissolved or? Yeah. yeah, sometimes it's an extra step. You can control the dissolving and leave some of the starch in there, but generally I'll dip them in some more starch that I've made from the salty. So just dissolving a lot of it into a tub of water and then spraying it. So um, the feel of these is, is important too. So this one doesn't have as much starch in it. It's much more flexible. And I'm interested in that range you can have with the pieces. Um, so I'll just show you quickly how I make the shapes. And this is just, you know, um, something that uh, I think reveals a little bit about the work in the show. It's not high tech. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty accessible. So iron, uh, flat embroidery. Then I take the edge of the iron and just kind of pull the edges of this piece and just kind of rotate it around. And I actually started using an, a hair straightener to do this process. Um, just like a $2 one from the Salvation Army. Uh, but you'll see then it becomes a three-dimensional form. So this, this move from flat drawing to three dimensions is something that I'm really interested in. I'm going to be working on a large project with digital embroidery and um, the Salvi um, to create a bit of a language with um, making more sculptural work. I'd like to make some big kind of stand on their own sculptures um, that might expand and contract. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in working at different scales. So you see in the show, all of the pieces are kind of this size, multiplied by a thousand. Um, and I'd like to start making some larger work to kind of contrast that scale. Um, I'm really comfortable with something that fits in my hands. Um, and I think that moving to a larger scale will be really interesting. I've done that with a lot of my more representational work. So um, looking forward to kind of spending some time in the studio and developing this sculptural language. Um, does anyone have any? Yes. When you, uh, when you 
to solve on your more representational pieces, which I'm assuming are larger, are yeah. full scale, right? Yeah. A lot of life. Yeah. So, did you use yeah. did you use the t your bathtub to, yeah. so that because you want to keep those pieces flat, right? Yeah. I use larger tubs of water. So imagine, so these pieces are this big. So I'm using a tub that's this big. Um, but I've made full scale representations of like my couch and chairs. So you kind of have to multiply the scale. So the bathtub is, is a really great um, dissolving surface. But with the larger pieces um, that are more representational, they have a lot more stitching than these pieces. So I've layered the threads over and over again, um, and they kind of have more shading. This, this work is really one line um, replicated. So with those pieces, they, they don't have the same, um, like these ones are really active when they're dissolving. They'll do anything with the larger pieces. They, they're pretty stable. And I, I sometimes even fold them and dissolve them and then unfold them and sub submerge them so that, because some of them are just too big for even the bathtub. And then did you still use a hoop? With with, no. Did you, just keep or did you do it free? I did it free. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's a couple different ways that you can work with the sewing machine. Like you kind of adapt to whatever scale you're working with. but. Um, with the dissolving, it's the same thing. So this is one mode of dissolving, but there's other modes that I've kind of used. So um, with the larger pieces, folding them really works well, but I've done some pieces uh, based on uh, apple boxes, like my moving boxes, and so those pieces are large. They're, they're spread out, um, but they needed to stay really stiff and in that square form. So what I did is I took insulation foam that I also used in this exhibition and pinned into the foam and then dissolved. So yeah, so what I find really interesting about working with this material and how I work in my studio is I'm always kind of trying to find solutions to things and there's always a solution. So um, whether you're working at a small scale or a big scale, um, yeah, there's ways to find um, new methods of working. Are there a lot of people doing this type of art or are you unique? Um, well that's interesting. I am not unique. There are, uh, because this is a readily available material, um, lots of people are using it. Um, and I had a question early on in my art career where I wasn't sure whether to reveal the making process and because uh, some people find it very like magical. And so um, I didn't know if it was the right thing to reveal the process or kind of keep it close to me. But the approach that I took is to share and to be open and to have the confidence that, you know, I'm doing things in my way, but someone else with this information would make something completely different. And um, I think giving everybody that information is the way that I like to, I like to work. So there's an Australian artist named Meredith Wolno who does amazing work. Um, and some other people are working really in really interesting ways with stitching and dissolving areas. But um, I'd say that this work is unique to me, but not the process at all. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm willing to like share and troubleshoot. I get emails a lot from students asking about the process and I try my best to kind of share it and um, keep that open dialogue because I think that that's when things get exciting. When you start to keep things just to yourself, I think it can get really isolating. So um, yeah, I share and there's lots of really amazing work being done with the material. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Well, I think we'll start the reception yeah. and then uh, you can make your way into the gallery. And if you have any more questions that you think of during the opening, just let me know. Super. So, well, thank you very much. And uh, like uh, Amanda said, uh, if you have any other questions, she's going to be here for the next couple of hours. There's a reception. And uh, feel free to come back and enjoy the work with a bit more knowledge on the process. And if, you, if anyone wants to dissolve or sew or something, you're welcome to do that too. I'm going to turn off the iron, but everything else is. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.